Hello and welcome to Expanded Knowledge. So we had the UAP hearing today, November 13th, 2024. I was fortunate enough to be able to watch the whole hearing from start to finish as it happened. And I did take some notes. And so I decided what I'm going to do for this video rather than kind of make a slideshow or queue up clips is I'm just going to give like a raw review while I'm still kind of, it's still kind of fresh for me. And maybe if you don't have time to watch the whole hearing, I still think if you're interested in this, you should watch the whole hearing so you can interpret it for yourself. But of course, here I'm going to give you the little parts that I thought stuck out and uh, try to read between the lines, offer my analysis on some some things. Um, I will say, on the whole, I'm, I'm disappointed. Um, definitely disappointed. But at the same time, I think that whether or not this hearing is a success will depend on how how the public responds and how the media covers it. So I think that if if we get if we can move the needle in that sense, then the hearing can be a success, even though for us here in the UAP UFO community, you know, probably as I would assume the reaction on the whole will probably be disappointment. I think we have to understand, though, that how small of a percentage of people are as, um, you know, read up on the topic as we are uh, than, you know, the average person. And maybe if you're tuning in for the first time, maybe you are brand new to the UFO UAP subject, in which case, you know, you'll, you'll get up to speed uh, just by spending time taking in different sources. And you know, that's, a, that's a whole other story. But here, you know, that's what I'm going to say to start us off is uh, it was disappointing because nothing new was said except maybe little nuances that we'll get to from the notes from it. Uh, but nothing new was said. And um, to be honest with you, in my view, it's it, from a standpoint of moving forward in, in getting the truth out and, and uh, kind of unraveling the uh, details about this. I think it was a step backward, you know, it, because in general it was more geared around well, there's these things that are flying around and we don't know what they are. I mean, that's been the story since 1947. Okay. And has certainly been the story, at least for the last eight years, you know, nothing new is really being said. They did start to inch closer to some of the things, right? Some of the private corporations, some of the um, details, some Congress members did ask some good questions, but on the whole, I thought it was it was it was pretty weak. It was pretty frustrating to sit through and watch. Ne nevertheless, um, we're going to get into it here now. Um, thinking probably do thirty minutes, maybe max it out at forty, and you know this format will just be sort of. Uh, I'll be just going to the general points in the hearing, and uh, just having it on the screen there. I'm I'm probably not going to play any clips for this uh, but i'm going to basically be pulling out a handful let's see i have one two three four five uh six and uh, yeah i don't know maybe 10 or so stars next to certain timestamps in the notes here so there were some interesting things let's get into it so obviously nancy mace chairing the hearing she opens it up and uh you know she breaks it out with basically saying that the Immaculate Constellation Program uh, report was being entered into the congressional record, you know, at that moment, which set off a very good tone because she framed it uh, incorrectly, actually, because she said it was a Pentagon report. And so that was like, whoa, for real? You know, I thought she, the way she said it, it was as if it was a Pentagon document confirming Immaculate Constellation's existence because remember they had they denied after michael schellenberger's article came out that immaculate constellation exists anyway we find out later in the in the hearing when schellenberger clears it up that this was simply the report that his whistleblower wrote and already gave to congress as it was said in the public article weeks ago so this was nothing new in fact these congress members could have gotten their hands on this earlier but anyway um you know, they moved through the opening statements. You had uh, 
Mace, you had Garcia who who comes in. And I'm sitting there going, wow, we're, we're right into this thing, setting the tone. And neither of them have even mentioned David Grush or his claims. And then it's actually this guy who, you know, with all due respect, I'm not too impressed with. He was the first to actually name David Grush. And um, he actually said that uh, he was briefed since the July 2023 hearing. But uh, Grush's claims have not been able to be substantiated, is what he said. And, um, you know, I, 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 there was really nothing much there. Okay, then we get into Moskowitz, who we know uh, has been involved with this. And uh, I would say, on the whole, in the hearing, I was, um, I was pretty happy with his approach. He was kind of assertive, a little bit even aggressive, um, though he didn't really uncover anything. We'll get to his questions later. Um but, you know, what he did say in the opening remarks here that was important was he said that the uh, for the record, you know, that when they've tried to look into this, he's been stonewalled, as he said. And he said specifically, which is, I think is very interesting for this, that uh, the panel members here, the con congressional committee members were asked not to have the hearings and they were asked not to ask certain questions. So that's fascinating, you know. Um, can we put Moskowitz on stand and say, who told you, who asked you not to ask certain questions? Who asked you? I mean, is that classified? Do you have to go into SCIF to say who asked you not to have the hearings? That that seems like that'd be pretty important information. Um, but anyway, moving along here, um, Mace, you know, Mace uh, opens up with the first round of questioning. Actually, not yet. All of the members make their own uh, opening statements. And so Gallaudet goes first. And, um, you know, he just read his opening statement, which was already available a couple of days ago. So I didn't really find anything interesting there. Um, now, in Elizondo's opening statement, he makes the he makes a quote, you know, that could be a soundbite and, and potentially, you know, could be something that say like the mainstream media or you know influencers could grab and run with uh, because he says quote we are not alone in the cosmos uh, matter of factly so you know i thought that was interesting that he says that and then um, shortly after that in his opening statement he did say uh, something that to me was new information i don't know if he's already said this I've, i listened to his news nation interview i listened to his joe rogan interview so probably the two biggest interviews he, he's done although i know he did a huge circuit um interviewing a bunch of places so i don't know if he's said this before but he did say it in his opening seminar he said that there's a specific person at the pentagon that all ufo uap inquiries go to this one person who's a psychological operation officer um which is pretty interesting for him to state there as a, a matter of fact of what's going on, because that's pretty telling if that's true. And, uh, you know, he does refer to and uses the word cabal in terms of um, who's covering up the UFO information. So, you know, we move along here. And, um, oh, and the other thing that he does say here to his credit is uh, he says in his opening statement that Congress needs to use their subpoena power to get witnesses on the stand that they can, so they can pry into these programs. And as he puts it, the hostile witnesses, like we heard David Grush say, and, and this is true. He's the only person literally in the whole hearing who says the word subpoena, which is probably the most powerful tool that Congress would have at this point to, if they actually wanted to bust open the truth about this would be to subpoena the key witnesses, which are already uh, available to them. Um, well, they're at least available to the Senate and uh, House Intelligence and Armed Services Committees. That's a whole other story uh, as to why they're not even here. Well, let's talk about that later. Um, moving along here. Okay, Schellenberger gives his opening statements. This is the journalist. And, uh, you know, he clarifies for us that the report was written by the whistleblower. It wasn't written, you know, with it as an official Pentagon document. And uh, there's really nothing of note that I had in his opening statements, nor did I have anything of note in um, Gold, the guy, uh, this guy, his first name, Michael, I think so, Michael Gold. Um, 
he basically just said that he thinks NASA, you know, because they're so popular, which he makes an interesting point, right? Is like NASA's an agency, um, space agency. People have like NASA shirts. There's like a whole um, public kind of perception of it. If they could be a leader on this, that could make an impact. That was kind of like his point. And uh, sure enough, but, and we'll get back to what he says about NASA later, but, uh, you know, it, we can see that NASA has been very much um, not transparent on this issue and many others in the past. And we know that Tim Burchett uh, went on the record saying that um, last in the year and a half ago hearing, they had more witnesses, but they were scared away. And one of the agencies that scared them away was NASA. So it doesn't really add up in that sense. But we move along here. And um, Nancy Mace comes out with the first round of questioning. And uh, she gets off to a hot start, in fact, because uh, she's very abrupt. She's very like, just tell me yes or no. Uh, don't elaborate unless it's necessary. And then, boom, she just rapid fires questions. Now, it sort of made me think, like, I think the whole hearing setup is ridiculous. And I, and I haven't studied this in more depth, but I don't know if they have to do that. Like, they have to have a certain number of committee members that each get five minutes of questioning. But... I'll be honest with you, the five minute, five minutes strict timing of questioning is ridiculous, I think. Um, you should just be able to naturally have a line of questioning and, and, and let things come out naturally. When you're under that timer, it really puts the pressure on, it really limits what can be elaborated on. And if one Congress member happens to be kind of onto a good thread and is, and is not just beating around the bush, you know, and is getting to the point, then they could go longer. I mean, you think about it, Nancy May, so you only have five minutes to, to ask questions in a two in a two and a half hour hearing. She gets another five minutes later. So okay, 10 minutes in two and a half hours. I mean, and then you have all these other people on the on the committee who are not really have not really been on this on the topic that closely. It's almost some of them seem like they're reading about it for the first time. <laughs> so it's just very inefficient, I think. Um, but anyway, Mace just asks questions. Um, she gets into it and actually, um, yeah, well, it's so far into the hearing, the opening statements go take up the first hour, which is a waste of time, I think. But anyway, um, she comes in and she's asked, she comes for Gallaudet and she's asking Gallaudet about his, about the incident that um he was made aware of okay and she asks him and you and you get it's funny because you get right into it the classic her first question he says i can't tell you that in a public hearing i'd have to tell you that in a skiff i'd have to tell you that in a closed setting and she's just asking for details about the the ufo sighting and she pries it out of him the shape and he does say verbatim that it was disc shaped. So again, I, I thought that was that was unique because I've never heard him get that specific before. And apparently he said they call it a button, but a disc shaped UFO is what was seen by uh, whatever he was involved with. One of the cases that that he was made aware of, um, it was it was verified that they saw a disc shaped UFO. And it's just interesting because, you know, we go all the way back to 1947 and actually even 1945. And we have we have Air Force reports from Air Force personnel of disc shaped craft. Um, so th and they're still out there, which is pretty interesting to uh, to think about. And, um, you know, she she asks other questions. Uh, they say they can't discuss the, the specifics about the crash retrievals. Now, she, she does ask do, to Elizondo, she asks him, do you think that they are non-human intelligence or are they secret you know, human programs? And to his credit, Elizondo does say they could be both and that, uh, that we just don't know. And, uh, you know, you could see, you could tell if you want to read between the lines that Mace is kind of trying to get to the heart of the matter here. Maybe she's been informed enough from the various perspectives in the UFO subject that it seems that there is really is a non-human intelligence. Of course, that's what Grush's claims are, but also that there that there's been reverse engineering for a very long time 
from since the late 40s at least and that so a lot of what's being seen and operated might actually be reverse engineered human technology and even in my in michael schellenberger's who's sitting there on the stand his witness who wrote this report that's sitting all there in congress's hands are he says in it verbatim alien reproduction vehicles which means workable you know functionable ufos that are human designed based on recovered alleged alien technology so it seems like she's up to speed on that because that's what her questioning she's going straight for that and she asks elizondo you know after that question are these in private corporations and interestingly and i thought that this was pretty interesting elizondo when when she asks him about the private corporations he says i'd rather not talk about that in a public setting yet yet when he did the interview with um, ross coltart on news nation he had no problem naming all of them you know i have another video on that raytheon lockheed martin boeing northrop grumman so he will say it on a news nation hearing but under oath to congress he chose not to say that and uh, i don't know if that's in his book i'm assuming it is but uh, interesting that he would choose not to name them for the record in the congressional hearing. We waited a year and a half for this. He's been, it's been eight years since he's come out. He finally gets in front of Congress for the record. Interesting choice. All right. So we move along. We move along here. And uh, next up on the questioning is Moskowitz. And uh, let's see here. Moskowitz asked some questions now, and I actually didn't really have anything good from his. Um, what he what what he does do though that's interesting is he grills Luis Elizondo pretty hard here, and he grills him about like because Elizondo said he signed a he signed a form that said he was not allowed to give any details about the crash retrieval programs that he was made aware of and that he was you know witnessed. So he says I can't tell you anything. And uh, and uh, basically Moskowitz just grills him and says, like, where did you sign this? Who was there? You know, yada, yada, yada. And he kind of it's a little bit tense, but nothing really comes out of it. And um, but it's an interesting little line of questioning. I would say if you're going to watch back uh, different five minute chunks, I would watch Moskowitz's. Uh, it was pretty interesting. Now, interestingly enough, this guy, uh, Grotham. <sighs> you know, actually is the first one to, to ask directly about David Grush. Um, and uh, in that, in this line of questioning, we get, we get some bits of information out of some of these gentlemen. For example, uh, Gallaudet says that when he met with Arrow, they tried to basically um, create a disinformation campaign on him so that he would kind of back down from this. And in part of that, very interestingly, he said in the question, he said part of that was him, uh, was them telling him or trying to uh, tell him that the Tic Tac was a, was a U.S. technology. And uh, even in my last video, I, I, I addressed those claims that have been made that uh, not necessarily a U.S. government technology, but... Uh, like a quasi-governmental, quasi you know, whoever is really running this, like private industry and, and whatever interests that have, you know, done this secretly, uh, That it's, but it's human nonetheless. Those are the claims out there and that the Tic Tac's not necessarily an alien spaceship. Um, but apparently Gallaudet was, uh, they attempted to tell him that it was a U.S. technology. And uh, also in this questioning that I that I found just weird, was at one point elizondo's being grilled like to be asked about how far back the data goes and he just keeps saying decades even when the, the um, grossman's like how many he just says decades but like why can't you say it goes back to 1947 because it, it, i think if like the public and congress and the record you know it, it's 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 affirmed and it's it's you know um stressed that this goes back to 1947 at the very least and you could say earlier 45 with the Foo Fighters 46 with the Swedish ghost rockets because that stuff is 100% documented 
in government files, hundreds of sightings from um, pilots and personnel. I mean, this goes back to 1947. Look at the Nathan Twining memo. You know, look at Project Sign. I mean, they were seeing these things 80 years ago and, and beginning to deal with this problem 80 years ago. So it's a deep, deep problem. And I think if more Congress people had that context that like, this is not some new phenomena. This is not something that we need to start studying now. This has been known in 80 years ago. So someone, they've been studying this, all right? And they've been keeping it from Congress and the general public. That's the heart of this whole thing. So I found it weird that Elizondo would not be like, goes back to 1947. And he would just keep saying decades because even on the Joe Rogan podcast, he kept saying he was talking about the late 1940s and the 1950s in detail on the Joe Rogan podcast. So, you know, pretty interesting. And, um, you know, we'll move along here. We'll move along here. Um, Burchett, Burchett gets up there. Um, and, uh, he, he brings up Grush to his credit and basically just gets on the record Elizondo saying that what Grush said is, is true. And to his knowledge, what Grush claimed is, is true. He affirmed it. And, uh, that was really all that I took from Burchett's questioning. Um, everything else was like already kind of talked about. It was redundant. So we'll move along now to this guy Higgins. Um, if you're if you're if you're looking for like an entertaining five minute round of questioning, I will go to this guy. Um, you know, he's got like a deep southern accent and uh he basically zeroed in on Schellenberger and he really grilled him about what this report was, who it was from. And uh, I would have to say, I think, you know, I'm sure it's really difficult to be there on the stand in such a setting. But, you know, I think I think Schellenberger was a little bit um, taken aback by it. And I didn't think he had the strongest responses. Um, but he kind of just pointed out that, like, this report didn't have a name on it. Um, this person's unnamed. He really tried to get out of Schellenberger, like, does this person work at the DOD? Schellenberger would only say this is current or former government employee. And, uh, you know, yeah, to be fair, to be fair, as much as you, we can respect a, a professional journalist like Michael Schellenberger, one that would get to the level of being on the stand here on an issue like this in Congress, technically this former government employee could technically just be writing this report. I mean, yes, Schellenberger verified who it was. He also got other, as he says in the article, an intelligence community um, officer to also verify that the program Immaculate Constellation is, you know, legit. So, but we can't get any more details about this person. And he kind of just pulls that out. Now, what he does pull out of it that's weird, at the end, he almost forces it out of Schellenberger. The fact that Schellenberger says after he published the article that, um, someone came to him and told him that Immaculate Constellation is sort of run by DOD or overseen by DOD or something like that, but it really is, uh, originates or is, you know, lives in the White House, which makes to me no sense. Because if you were to have, as Immaculate Constellation is being described, this program that has all the data on the whole thing and the whole story going all the way back to whenever, um, and that's how people are, are describing it, right? Why would it be in the White House? The presidents are the ones who, again and again, each administration, they never, they, they ask about it and they're told that there's nothing there or they're read in and then they say they can't talk about it. Um, and I, I am very skeptical of the idea that Immaculate Constellations run out of the White House. But that's what Schellenberg said this one person told him after he published the article. Anyway, um, you know, we move along here. We have this guy, uh, Frost, come on board. And um, I didn't really find any of his questions significant. However, he did say that he was at a top secret facility once 
getting a tour and that he was going by like an uh, a hanger, multiple hangers. And he was told, yeah, that's we lease that out to a private contractor and we have no idea what they're doing. So that's like an interesting little um, anecdote, I think, because, you know, like maybe this is where some of these things are happening. Um, reverse engineering, who knows what type of secret operations, uh, which is why there's like this crossover with private government and, um, you know, and uh, pri uh, private corporations in the government and, and whoever's behind really, you know, and the intelligence community and, and however else it's interlocked into, as Elizondo calls it, a cabal that's, you know, knows what's going on with this or and is even maybe has have, you know, operating these so-called alien reproduction vehicles, as Schellenberger's witness put uh, said it. So uh, Luna's questions were probably the most out there, I'd have to say. Um, she asks in a very interesting question that Elizondo almost, I think he didn't understand the question because she asks if the craft are operated by a mind body connection. And what it seems that she's clearly saying is what we've heard in the UFO lore over the, the years that these craft are not, you know, operated by like flying them and pulling levers and stuff, uh, you know, pushing buttons, but actually are use a sort of consciousness like a sort of tech uh telepathic psychic um functioning you know we've heard claims from this from different whistleblowers you know that still are not verified for example if you, you can go back to uh, lieutenant colonel philip corso said that they discovered that and then you had like michael herrera who's been saying that in the last couple of years and, and in many other places, those are just a name too. But she asks the question and Elizondo basically just kind of dances around it. Um, he, it didn't seem like he really understood it. She asks about the interdimensional. She asks if, they, if the craft are living things. And every question Elizondo basically just says like, I don't know, essentially. Um, and she, she goes on to ask about an important question, I think. Finally getting a little more into juicier stuff. You know, she does ask, has anyone had firsthand experience with entities? And uh, nobody's able to give any kind of response and just says, you know, they haven't had anything. or They don't, they don't answer the question, really. They kind of dance around it. She goes on to ask that, that she understands that there may be good and bad entities. And uh, they, they, they really don't give a clear answer on that. She also asks um, with the key question, right, of what what's the energy behind these, right? Like the propulsion and could, do you think that this could be like, if it's already understood that this could be something that could revolutionize our world, you know? So, and she's really the only one that kind of asks that kind of a question. And all I have in my notes here is all capital letters uh, wasted. So in another way, in another sense, she asked these questions you know, the elephant in the room type of questions, like, are people interacting with these things? Um, what's their agenda? And and what about the energy technology behind them? Um, and nobody really gives, gives an answer. So um, we get back to um, Congressman uh, Garcia now and his line of questioning. And, and we're sort of moving towards towards the end of the hearing here. We're getting it, we're getting there, and Garcia basically does it, takes an approach where he has all four members kind of answer, and he says, you know, uh, what do you think is the origin of the UAP? And you have Gallaudet say non-human higher intelligence. You have Elizondo say same thing, and then you have Schellenberger and Gold say they don't know, and that's basically all that that happens there. And uh, then you get this guy, Briggs, who seems like he's just reading it for the first time. And um, it's really like nothing there. Now, if I were to tell you right off of my initial reaction from, from watching the whole hearing, uh, and you were to say like, what, who, which, which person asked the best questions or like kind of stood out to you, it would actually be uh, Burleson, this guy. 
uh, because he got to the heart of the matter okay with his with his measly five minutes that they all get and he goes right for it he co he comes at elizondo saying yo where where are the materials at and uh he first he first brings up the thing that we all know about that's documented and, and that's pretty pretty huge which is is it true that OSAP was supposed to get UFO materials from um, Lockheed, right? And that they were blocked. And Lou Elizondo says, yes. Burson even brings up Christopher Sharp because Christopher Sharp's reporting said that it was a CIA that, that blocked it. Um, and Lou sort of just says, oh, I don't know the details of exactly, but, I, but we know, he says, we know for sure that that happened. We know for sure, you know, it was blocked. And, and so there's that okay that that's that might be the most significant piece from the hearing maybe you know that on the record here we have that a private aerospace company was going to give away materials cut recovered said to be of a exotic non-human intelligence origin technical technical materials was going to give it to a a government funded program to study and that that and transaction was blocked by another by an, an intelligence agency i mean that should tell a lot right there and thank you to eric burleson for asking those questions but he's not done yet um he goes on and he, and he says stops beating around the bush you know he says right to him how can we get our hands on this material how can we go and touch one of these craft um and, and, you know and he says you know he says Elizondo kind of like just dances around the question and he says, all right, well, what would you do? Like, what do you recommend we do? And uh, Elizondo, he, he kind of again dances around the question, but and basically leads to saying that that's what Arrow was supposed to do. And he basically says um, that 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 Arrow and maybe with the new leadership arrow will be able to do that and that would be the body through which to get this done of course the problem is as we know that arrow has been you know not forthcoming with doing a real job of this we've had multiple 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 government and military officials say that um you heard tim gallaudet the other day say that uh sean kirkpatrick the director arrow when t when gallaudet met him that kirkpatrick told him i'm a, i'm a counterintelligence agent and smiled at him Right. He said that the other day to Ross Coulthard. So. But yes, here's the thing. And I don't know if enough people are talking about this. Actually, the new Arrow director uh, is this guy, Koslowski. Right? I think his name is John Koslowski. Now, he's a friend of Jay Stratton. And after he was uh, he was appointed to be that new Arrow director, Jay Stratton put out a comment and said. He's a good friend of mine. I got a text from him saying that he got the arrow job and I trust him and I think this is good. So if that's true, that's great because Jay Stratton was the UAP task force director. Jay Stratton is a person who hired David Grush. So whatever you want to think about, whatever the UAP task force, it seems pretty clear that they were actually using their congressional mandate and their authority to go actually investigate what's going on with this and look at what it turned out. It turned out what David Grush said a year and a half ago. Um, so maybe, maybe there's a silver lining there. Maybe Elizondo's answer is more telling than it seems. Maybe with this hearing that's supposed to happen, I think next week with the Senate, uh, the new arrow director, maybe they're actually going to go and start getting to see the materials and getting to unravel what's going on. Although I don't know if that's true. Um, my understanding is arrow was supposed to like study like what the phenomena is, you know, not like go into special access programs and like knock on doors and, and subpoena people. Um, although I think they do, they definitely did have that and do have that ability, but let's see, you know, the whole arrow thing is very interesting. And um, I think I'll, I'll save my analysis on that for the end. Cause there's another side to this whole congressional aspect that I think we need to think about. Uh, but let's get to Burleson's next question, because now, boom, he he drops another bombshell, drops another bombshell. By the way, he does specify um, 
about alien bodies. And props again to Burleson for not beating around the bush and getting to the point. He says, all right, so you got materials. You, they got they got bodies too? They have alien bodies? And Lou Elizondo says, yes. And he says, um, Elizondo says, yes, this was discussed quite a bit at, at the Pentagon. Okay, so Elizondo on the record to a Congress member is saying, and this should be one of the big highlights that hopefully the media would take away, the mainstream media, is that Elizondo saying to him, yes, the, the Pentagon spoke about it a lot about recovered alien bodies. I mean, that's huge. And then he, pivot, he, he pivots from there and he says, with his last question, he says, has there been communication between non-human intelligence and humans? And uh, it's funny because Elizondo kind of like starts to dance around it. And then, and then Burleson just says it again. He's just like, no, I'm talking about like communication between you know, whatever, aliens and, 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 and humans, whether the government or whatever, military. And uh, it's a great question. And Elizondo does a good job against, again, uh, dancing around it and uh, basically saying like, he basically says like, well, how do you define communication? That's kind of his answer. <laughs> and, uh, and then he, he lastly, with his last minute there, he verifies uh, that there are reverse engineering programs. He gets Elizondo to, again, confirm that. She said a million times that there definitely are. All right. So um, props to Burleson. Probably, probably the best round of questioning, I'd have to say, of, of everyone. Um, and then we move along. We see some new faces. This guy, Timmons, um, seems like he's kind of new to it, uh, but doesn't really say too much. Um we get into this line of questioning, which was rather bizarre in my view, uh, but maybe not bizarre, but she, she, she went kind of out there with some stuff, which is pretty interesting for us to break down here. This is Bobart, probably, probably not saying the name right, but um, she asks some pretty interesting questions. She basically asks about hybridization programs, which we've heard about. You know, We've even heard from credible people like the Harvard lawyer, Danny Sheehan, say that this is going on, allegedly. Um, she asks about knowledge about, um, yeah, genetic engineering and, and hybrid programs with aliens. And, uh, all of the panel members just say decline that to know, to be able to comment at all. And then she goes on to say, like, she says, okay, there's been these UFO sightings, crash retrievals, and sometimes biologics. And she basically asks, do you, have you found anything to suggest that the biologics themselves could be like genetically engineered biological forms like made by humans, right? Which is like a whole nother angle to this. And you hear, for example, like Stephen Greer in the Disclosure Project claims that witnesses have told them that there are what they call programmed life forms, which are like these kind of robots that are also like biological and, you know, that they have those. Now I wouldn't put it past, I wouldn't put it past um, the the dark state, as we might call it. Um, you know, the intelligence communities, the military industrial apparatus, private industry, and where that that all intersects into these these uh, apparently you know problematic groups here that are that are doing this, and um, they all just say no. They've never seen any evidence or anything that they could comment on about that. Um. But I thought it was pretty interesting that she went there with it, uh, but they didn't give her much to go. They didn't give her much on that. And then uh, I thought it was just kind of ridiculous. And maybe the hearing was starting to unravel at this point because she starts asking like really specific questions about USOs and underwater bases and stuff. And she's asking Schellenberger. And, you know, Gala Dead is like the guy to ask about that. And like Schellenberger's answering questions about like how much of the ocean's been explored and stuff. And, I thought that was a little weird. Like I thought maybe Shell Murger could have been like, I'm going to, I'm going to refer to, to Mr. Gallaudet here. Um, but that was an interesting one. Um, and then as we wrap it up here, you know, we get back to Mace. She, she gets her second round uh, of questioning and I don't have anything starred here. So, you know, she tries to pry into the private company angle more, which I think is very smart. I think that she's she's smart. I think she knows what she's doing, but uh, maybe is you know not able to commit all of her time and focus into this. But um, it seems like she she's coming with the right angle in general. 
And um, Elizondo is very hesitant to like go any further about the private companies, but they do kind of focus on Lockheed. And he basically says that Lockheed is, is quote, involved in a lot, meaning stuff in low Earth orbit or even in the sea. Um, and not necessarily just aerospace, uh, that they also have stuff in the sea. Now, uh, you know, she asked some decent questions, but like, you know, she asked like, how do we get more whistleblowers? But like, you know, are you really asking that to these people? Or are you like doing that for a reason for the public to hear that? Like, because I wouldn't ask them like how to get more whistleblowers. Like, that's something you can figure out, um. I think that's something you can go to the appropriate agencies. You're, you know, you're the representative that should figure that out. You guys should be pushing for legislation to make it easier, more protections for whistleblowers, for example. Um, and then it, it kind of just goes around the horn. And, and uh, you know, I thought maybe a little telling. I can't get a read on this guy, Gold. He, he didn't get to speak very much at this hearing. Um, but, you know, one thing he did say that... Uh, I thought was pretty interesting was uh and which is why i don't know if i trust this guy he seems like a decent guy but um at one point he said nasa is quote the most transparent agency that he that he's ever known and um i don't know people who have dug into nasa stuff over the years it seems like they're pretty shady and are, are and even like tim burchett saying that NASA scared other witnesses off of a year and a half ago from testifying. And then you got gold up here saying NASA is the most transparent agency in the world. Um, seems a little bit of a red flag for me, but you know, at the end here, he kind of says like, we don't know what intelligence really is and we don't know what these technologies are. And he says, I think we're all going to be surprised when we find out. And you know, I don't know. You know, we don't know these people. Like, we don't know what they might really know behind the scenes or what their agenda really is. Um, but hell, I would have asked uh, Michael Gold. I would have, if I was Burchett, right? I would have said, So, you know, what do you think about the fact that NASA scared our witnesses off? What does that say to you? Um, be curious to see what, what he said. You know, yeah, I would have asked a lot of different questions, but. Some people did a good job. And then to end it off, we get uh, Andy Ogles at the end here. And um, he comes in late. He's, he comes running in at the end there, actually, which is maybe interesting in itself. Um, but, you know, he goes through some of the stuff. And, and, like, some of this stuff was just frustrating, like, stuff we've just been hearing about for, like, you know, since the 60s, since before the 40s, you know, and it's the same old, same old. Um, and maybe I'll elaborate on that at the end here. But let's just say, let's just talk about the highlights from Andy Ogles. Um, you know, he does. He is able to get Gallaudet say something that I think they all should have said, which is like how the implications of this. All right, because you're going to get a public looking in on this and going, ah, you know, yeah, interesting little thing. But like the implications are just massive. That's why we care about this, right? Is uh, that's why I'm even, you know, taking time to talk about this is because the implications would just be massive. You know, be revolutionary. Um, and and Gallaudet does say there, you know, quote this greatest issue of our time. And then um, my last note on Andy Ogles here is he kind of brings in a good line of questioning, and he says, look. You know, these are either these are either an adversary, like China, or they're they're ours, or they're some other non-human intelligence. And he and he says, and and he's, I want to say he's on the Armed Services Committee, uh, but I don't know. But I think he he's kind of like part of his job is to be knowledgeable on the the threats that adversaries have. And so he says, you know. He says, I'm confident that, you know, China wouldn't have this before us, you know, and that they're, they're usually lagging behind our military aero tech, air technology and aerospace technology. And so he says, so that means it's either we have it secretly and, um, and we should know that we have it, you know, or it's, it's, it's otherworldly, as he says, you know, he says, quote, is it ours or is it otherworldly? He says, we must know. And he's right. And he's right. Um, 
and you know he does say like it's criminal that it's been kept secret whatever the truth is and which may be a reason why it's going the way it has you know one thing that um lester nair said some months ago was uh that you know if if these are this is a criminal criminal charges this would be an investigation that's ongoing would be in the department of justice actually and they wouldn't they would want to be keeping things on the low so it doesn't compromise it so that maybe could be the reason why we haven't seen, seen things move forward as much, fast as we'd like and now a year and a half later after david grush came forward and maybe why grush has been quiet maybe why you know, none of these Congress members have been able to meet in a skiff and get the exact names and the exact locations and the exact programs and all of this, uh, because maybe this is being investigated as a criminal investigation by another department like the Department of Justice. Um, so, you know, all in all, that's it. You know, that's what happened. Uh, that's that's the rundown there. And I would say, yeah, on the whole, it's really going to depend on how the media takes it. I'd say here's a silver lining, right? After the hearing ended, I was pretty disappointed and pretty despondent about it because I felt like it was just like a waste. Like you're talking about the same things that we've been hearing like for 80 years, you know, like, yeah, they go over the nuclear sites. Like we've known that like the Malmstrom, they knew that in 1967 or whenever that was. And uh, it's nothing new. You know what I mean? But 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 this can all be new for people that are tuning in for the first time. And so it could be important in that way to go through all the rudimentary stuff that you and I probably all already know. Those of us who follow the UFO subject for a while now, um, the public needs to hear it. And, and here's the silver lining, right? My mom texted me and said, uh, and basically said, like, um, told me what, what my aunt, her sister said, who, who never, you know, even heard anything about this. And, and she said, uh, so I'm watching a televised hearing on Capitol Hill right now. Verified sightings of UFOs and even that alien bodies do exist and have been retrieved and enhanced in some manner of our government, exclamation point, exclamation point, right? So it, this may be a good test here of, of how maybe the average person may take the news. Um, and the fact that she heard about it so shortly after or even saw it on TV you know, casually, that's maybe a great sign. And it seems like at least that was communicated, right? Maybe that needed to be communicated again, even though we know this already from a year and a half ago, it seems like the media and the apparatus of the, of the psychological operation apparatus behind this all was able to suppress it enough that it didn't, it didn't reach a mass level where people got into it. I mean, there's still people, you know, as of weeks ago that just never heard of David Grush, never heard of the hearing. Um, or the details about it. Never heard of the UAP Disclosure Act. So, you know, maybe this is a good sign. And again, it goes to that point. How the media and the public re react to this hearing is is more important, I would say, than the hearing itself and where we'll go with it. Um, the fact of the matter is this, though. This is the House Oversight Committee. As far as I know, nobody on this panel today, except maybe Ogles, maybe one or two other, um, but the vast majority, none of them are on the, author the, uh, the authorized committees of the House and Senate of the U.S. Congress that are allowed to receive this information and whose job and a special authority it is to oversee this information. And that's the Senate and House Armed Services and Intelligence Committees. And you see none of those people here today. Um, and you see that they haven't started a committee to investigate this, that there hasn't been any movement on it, aside from the UAP Disclosure Act, which I personally have a lot of issues with. Um, I think it's a bad idea to give the president ultimate authority over who's on this panel. And if information gets disclosed or not, because like I've said in, in previous videos, if you read the, the details of the UAP Disclosure Act, ultimately the president can disclose information up to 25 years and indefinitely beyond that. So do we really want, you know, the what information is shared about our reality to be in the hands of the president? I mean, give me a break. Give me a break. So I, I don't think the UAP Disclosure Act, as it's been designed, is the right route. Um, you know, it's we hear the same thing again and again now. You, it, when every time a Congress member asks 
the right question and like like uh, Burleson did here how can we get our hands on this how do we move forward you know the, and they say I can't speak about it publicly you know where you could go I've talked to you about it in a, in a close setting well where are the, why don't these close settings happen you know what I mean something behind this is really not adding up I think um, and maybe it's a controlled disclosure or maybe it's just uh, the the power structure that wants to keep holding the secrets is just keeps delaying it um, as much as possible and they're succeeding with with a degree of success there you know um, so we'll see what happens we'll see what happens and um, I'd, I'd we need to get the first-hand witnesses up there you know we need to get a guy or a gal up there and to say so you worked from this year to this year at, at, at whatever area 51 or you worked here is it true that you put your hands on a craft that was determined to be of a non-human origin yes you saw an, a biologics that were non-human origin. yes okay don't give the, you don't have to give the details of where when how why who but come up on the stand we needed to get to that level maybe maybe because that would be like pretty just like a shock to the public maybe they needed another hearing like this to corroborate last year's hearing to kind of be on the same level even though i feel like this is a little bit of a step down because they're talking about the same things they were talking about the 2022 hearing we, we already we already know that the objects are out there we already know they're on that there's videos of them um another detail that popped up here actually is that schellenberger was asked and he said to his understanding there's hundreds or thousands of high res videos of ufos um so yeah i don't know what's going to happen um you know i don't know what's going to happen we see that some interesting um appointments that uh the president-elect trump has said in terms of for example secretary of state uh, marco rubio who's who's been pro you know ufo disclosure although some of his other policies are uh personally you know i find problematic you know he seems to be like a, you know seems to be like a neocon um but i do like what he said about the ufo stuff the, the cia director that has been talked about uh what is it radcliffe uh, you know what he said about ufos seemed fair so is is the networks being set up that will actually move this issue forward or will they just use it to continue to uh, you know boost up the military industrial complex and um will they use it for some other type of psychological operation um i don't know and i gotta say you know this hearing more than any i was excited for this hearing you know i was genuinely excited i genuinely thought that we were going to see you know um something new come out of this and uh you know it was disappointing and so for me i'm i'm kind of like feeling like a little bit of taking a step back from it and and just understanding that if we're if we're going to be waiting on the government to get us you know more information on this we're, we're probably going to be waiting for a while and we're and then we're not going to get the full picture even then but um i, I hope you know we can walk away with like a balanced takeaways here there were definitely some positive signs you know they definitely are still open to the idea that there are secret you know non-governmental or quasi-governmental entities that might have a handle on this technology and are doing something with it plus the fact that it, it seems according to all the testimony and the evaluations that there really is you know we really are not alone um, and there really is another type of intelligence form out there that's behind the, some of these technologies um that's still all on the table which that's a good thing and the, you know the fact like i like i showed you like that my aunt heard about this already and and that's her takeaway right is um like what what i read to you there maybe is a good sign um because if we can get greater public awareness on this then that's a win and and maybe in the next hearing we'll be able to move forward um but 
you got to get those witnesses in. I really didn't like how nobody focused on that aspect. Maybe they had an agenda. Maybe they just wanted to keep it keep it simple for people. But uh, this was an opportunity we had to wait a year and a half for. And damn, man, I would have definitely pried into, you know, why where are Grush's witnesses? You know, how, what can we do to move forward on this? But I think part of the reason that didn't happen is because this is the House Oversight Committee. It's not the Senate Intelligence Committee. It's not the House Intelligence or Armed Services Committees um, who would have the authorities to kind of pry into that classified information, which they already have. Um, that's why we've had the UAP Disclosure Act and uh, and so forth. So, yeah, I think we'll we we'll think we'll end it there, um, and we'll see what happens. I'm I'll be curious to see what people say and pull out of this in the next few days and over the next week or two. And I'd be curious what the follow up, what the public response is. I'd be curious what people think about this Michael Gold choice. I think it was a little a little bit strange and um, raises my red flag a little bit just to call NASA the most transparent agency, you know, that there is based on, you know, what a lot of researchers have uncovered over the years. But anyway, that's the hearing, guys. Uh, we waited a year and a half for it. Um, we were excited about it. I was excited about it. And uh, hopefully there's a silver lining. So thank you for watching once again. Uh, have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.